2024 is finally here and we make a massive final table on the first day of the year. $400 buy-in, 1,995 entrants, and over $110,000 for first place. Can we kick off the year with a six-figure score? Let's find out. So Slick, Slick's going all in. Slick Ricks with the snap call. Right, well, Slick Ricks got Ace Jack here. Nice. Let's see what he wants to do. Uh-oh, uh-oh. Alex got the Queens. Well, welcome in to the first video of 2024. And quick background of how we got here and everything you need to know going in to the final table. And I know people have short attention span these days, so if you wanna jump right along, I will post a time below. Texas Card House hosted a tournament to end the year, to welcome the new year, $400 buy-in, eight different flights with day two happening on the new year. I just came back from my WPT trip in Vegas. And for those of you that follow along and for those of you that don't know, that trip did not go well for me. So I came back from the trip feeling very burnt out, very tired, but I knew that this was gonna be a very good value tournament to fire in. So that's what I did. I max late reg flight C. Unfortunately, we min cash that one. And then I did it again, flight E. And fortunately made day two with just over 25 big blinds. Entering day two, we've had around 150 to 180 players remaining and after 14 hours of play we made another final table so another final table and i know this is a game of skill but with fields like this it has huge variance but we did it again fortunately we just run very very good on day twos and we made another final table we enter the final table around top three in ships and so I felt extremely, extremely confident going into it. And no offense to any of my opponents that I played against, but I believe the final table was basically full of all recreationals. I thought I had a massive edge over the field. So, and yeah, with huge pay jumps on the line, I knew there would be a lot of ICM in play. So felt really, really good. And my game plan was not anything crazy, just play pretty standard and make you know, let my opponents make mistakes in these spots. So, you know, that was kind of my thought process going into it, feeling really good, feeling really positive. You know, we've had a great year to get to this point. So wanted another massive score in the books. Can we do it? I think I talked enough. Let's get into the hands. Let's go. Okay, as we get into it and a quick reminder of the payouts, you can see them on the screen locked up about $6,000. But as you can see, massive pay jumps ahead of us with couple short stacks in play. To start off the final table, we fold the first 18 hands of the session. Not really anything to talk about other than we didn't get any hands until hand number 19, slick and C2 raises it to 1.3 million with pocket deuces. This is a massive raise in the final table. And we look down at the beautiful pocket kings. Couple things to think about preflop. I definitely thought about just three bet or jamming as this hand is so good and slicks range should be pretty tight given the race size and position. However, I have played with this specific opponent throughout the day and knew that this was a pretty standard race size for him. As a result, I wanted to keep all of his range in play and didn't want to fold out anything. Lots of players often become a little scared in these spots and worry about ace high flops and letting people get there. However, we need to maximize our EV and with big money up top, we need to take spots that will help us get the max. So so with everything we factored in, I decided to flat in position and go to the flop, but we go heads up to a pretty favorable flop of six, four, three, two clubs. This shouldn't hit him very hard other than lots of over pairs and over cards, but he makes our decision easy when he just ships it in. We couldn't call fast enough and we are showing the good news when he flips over pocket deuces. It's not the greatest card as he has backdoor flushes and a gutter and based on how I've been running in Vegas, I was definitely nervous, but the run out is very clean and we can pick up a massive pot to knock out one of the players and become one of the chip leaders. Next hand, we have ace jack suited on the button and raise things up to 600k. The short stack in the small blind puts the remainder of the chips in and that brings the big blind in play. Flop is another good one, 10, 7, 4, 2 hearts. So we have enough flush draw, but when check two, we decided to check this one back. No need to really bloat the pot against the chip leader with one person already all in. Turn is slightly worse. Eight of spades goes check, check. River is the jack of diamonds. So we make top pair. Didn't see much reason to value in this spot. So check this river back and get the good news that we're good. So we now got the first two players of the final table. What a dream spot. And we are chipping right along. Seven players left. 
let's stay focused and keep moving along a little later we have another knockout so we have locked up around seventeen thousand dollars to this point down to six players and that brings us to the next hand which is probably the most interesting hand of the final table we look down at jack 10 offsuit in the small blind against the other big stack in the big blind and with other short stacks around there's no really any reason to raise in this spot so we limp in and the big blind raises it up to 800k not going anywhere not much to do but a simple call and we go to a decent flop a 10 7 6 so we make top pair we check he bets small for 500k and we quickly make the call turn is very good it's a jack so we have top two we check he checks it back river is a king i did think about checking to trap here as i thought he was a player who would likely fire some massive bluffs but decided that i wanted to go for value myself and i pick a pot size bet of three million and instead of a quick call or quick fold i get the weird news he's all in and the chip sizes are actually a bit off he goes all in for 11 million total so i have 8 million left to call and i have about 9.5 million at the time so this is essentially for the tournament life and i'm thinking to myself what is going on now there are a few factors in play if this was honestly against any other player at the table i'd probably not think about this spot too much and just fold the reason being is that i don't think that this is ever a spot most recreationals find bluffs so that was kind of out of the question and so now why did i say against this specific player well this player has been playing pretty well to this point and i have been seeing lots of plays that are on the questionable side so one really big question i had was can he do this with worse value hands and simply put can he overvalue his hands and i definitely thought he could i thought he could do this with hands like ace king and king queen and that was the only reason why it tanked so long as i did i knew that obviously i was losing to all the straights like queen nine ace queen king 10 king seven actual value hands but if he had value that i could beat i shouldn't most of the time call in general so after a few minutes clock was called and i ended up making the fold and few reasons why i did this as discussed i believed i had a massive edge over the table and at the end of the day even against a wild player this spot was pretty marginal and with a big edge with other short stacks in play i decided that this spot was just not worth the risk of losing my tournament life over and later i found out that he did have king queen so he was overvaluing his hand Honestly, even looking back at this hand and the result, I'm actually very happy with the decision that I made. And I think this is one of the lessons that I take away, took away from the Poker Atlas tour where I made a pretty marginal bluff catch against another good player. Yeah, I, I think that this is the right one. I think in a similar spot in the future, I make way more money by folding in a spot like this than calling. And also I may just benefit again from ICM by checking even with two pair to just check call versus is betting and facing a spot like this so very very interesting hand lots to analyze but so those are some of my thoughts and analysis about that hand well i am very very sorry to interrupt but i just wanted to announce that we dropped these good luck us hoodies you will find them in the goodluckus.com i'll put the links down below but yeah this is almost a year since i started this journey and i wanted to create something meaningful to me and something that i wanted to share with the community so just drop these hoodies jump to the website get cop one of these show some support sorry for the interruption let's get back into it we are down to four players locked up thirty-five thousand six hundred dollars. i am feeling honestly extremely great about my play great about the decision to fold earlier and with one other short stack feeling extremely confident about another pay jump for remaining i am second in chips but everything falls apart in the next and we look down at 7-6 offsuit in the small blind with an 8 big blind stack in the button. I decide to put max ICM pressure and just shove. The big blind thinks about the hand and ends up making the call. This is a nightmare situation. The run out does not help us at all. And now we are down to one of the shorter stacks. So let's pause. What happened here and what was I thinking? Couple things. I knew that with the short stack on the button, it would be a profitable spot to shove any two. And I think we can quickly take a look at an ICMizer solver to show that. Okay, so we are going to look at a tool called ICMizer. And for those of, those of you that don't know what this tool is, you basically plug in stack sizes and the situation 
and it will simulate different results and simulate whether you know you made the right call preflop or not and this is kind of how you study tough finals table spots there's lots of tools you can use but i use icmizer for one of them so i put in the stack sizes here and as you can see at this chart it is a shove with any two spot and that's what i was thinking in game so i knew that this was profitable and as you can see the calling range for our opponents is very very narrow and i believe probably in game most recreationals will be folding a lot tighter so sevens eights nines i don't even honestly see them calling it here even tens possibly i don't know ace ten ace jack i think most people are folding so our shove becomes a lot more profitable um, when we do that and we can actually see right we can take these some of these outs and we can calculate based on the results and as you can see it makes our shove a bit more profitable but so now we know this is a profitable play but why do i not like it why do i not like it if you can see from the chart yes it's certainly profitable but how do we actually study these spots and how do we learn from them what i was thinking so the ev of this play is obviously positive um given that there's a small stack in the button but if you can look at the ev of picking up the spots it's not as high it's 0 0.73 so it's not that high and so for me it becomes another marginal spot that we are taking and similar to the jack 10 situation before it's another marginal spot and we don't have to really get into given our edge and don't really need to risk the time they wake up with it which is exactly what happened so if this didn't happen you know we wouldn't have talked about it and maybe we talk about oh how good of a play it was and how i'm picking up all these marginal spots but it did happen and we suffer the consequences of it so you know i think this is the importance of working with solvers and understanding how to work with them yes it is profitable but let's look at the ev of it and let's look at different solutions let's like icmizer can't really work with open raising you know and i think open raising to three to four big blinds is just as effective in the spot versus a show and it is a similar ev gain and another mistake that i made in game that i'm going to be transparent I miscounted his stack. I did not think he had 11 million. I didn't think he had over 30 bigs. If I did, I'd probably lean towards raising three, four big blinds and going post flop. If he shoves, okay, I can easily fold. Yeah, many factors here, but this is one of the reasons why I really didn't like the play and why it's important to not, in poker, to not only think about what is profitable but and what solvers would do, but really think about the future game implication and how your impact or how your edge impacts the way you approach different spots. So hope this is a bit helpful, but that's really what I was thinking in game. And as you can see, it is a, it is the correct play. But a lot of the times I feel like, you know, and nowadays in the solver world era, people constantly talk about, oh, it was a profitable show or it was a profitable, you know, bluff. But when we actually think about it and sit down and figure out all the factors that go into play, you know, I don't like it. And I don't think this is the, the plus EV play to move moving forward. So a tough one there and we move on to the next hand where we pick up king seven of hearts in the cutoff we decide to ship this one in and unfortunately get a call in the button we are up against ace queen and the flop is great king queen jack rainbow can we please hold now however the turn seals our fate and we are officially knocked out of the final table and this hand was the one that bothered me the most a few reasons why from an icm perspective so we are back to another icmizer spot and we look at this spot i have plugged in all the stack sizes here and as you can see from an icm perspective this is just a pure fold it's not really even close so that's really the number one mistake i believe like king nine suited king ten suited is like a decent shove there and i probably still would shove but so that was number one and i'll tell you why this hand bothered me the most um, out of any hand of this session so that's the number one mistake. Number two, I miscounted my stack again and the big blind stack. I actually thought that I was shorter than him. And as a result, I, I thought the shove was okay. But I actually looked at the miscounted spot when I am actually shorter than him. And it's still an ICM mistake. It's just not a shove in this spot. It is just way too wide. And so just a massive mistake and we pay for it. Like we pay for it immediately because if we made the right play, big blind probably would have been knocked out. He had pocket eights and would have lost to ace queen and the flip. So we pay for it. And this is just the importance of staying in the moment and making quality decisions, guys. I, to be honest, I was a bit annoyed in this spot already with my seven, six off shove. I felt like bad decisions piled on. And now, you know, I, in poker or in life, it's okay to make a wrong play 
or wrong decisions. What we can control is our response and how we act after. And I don't think I did a good job of recovering in this tournament. And this is just another lesson that I'll take with me. You know, we played around 16 hours at this point. My mind is fatigued. My body is fatigued. I just shoved 7-6 offsuit in the small blind in one of the biggest final tables. And it's important to realize in this moment that this is the situation that I'm in. And the only thing we need to focus on is the next play. But that's not what I did. And I paid for it in the end. And so after all the hard work of getting to this point two hands were all that it took to knock me out of the tournament well that is it for the final table and still watching this back a week later this is just so frustrating and you know the car ride back home was one of the most frustrated I've been uh, in my career. And, you know, don't get me wrong, the 35K score and finishing fourth out of 2,000 players is just amazing. And I am just super grateful for the good run. But in a game of opportunities, I felt like I let this one slip away. I just thought I had a massive edge over this field and just couldn't get it done. So it hurt a lot. But, you know, this is the game we play. You know, you work so hard, but a couple of mistakes can just blow away your equity just like that. But another massive experience, another great experience to build upon. And I am looking for what 2024 has in store. But yeah, guys, hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you guys haven't, hit that like button, comment, subscribe. It really does help. And, you know, 2024, I'm setting a massive goal. I want to get 100K subscribers by the end of the year. So help me out. Hit that subscribe button. And yeah, we are going to be pushing hard on long form content. So I'm really, really looking forward to what this year has in store for us. We're going to be playing poker in a lot of different places. And I'm going to try to add value as much as I can. And we're going to try to see what we can take with this poker content thing. So hope you guys enjoy. Happy New Year. Wish you all the best. Let's keep this going. 2024. Let's go.